Hi, everyone. I think we can all start to take our seats. I hope everyone had the chance to try some of our plastic avoided spread that we worked so hard on. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It is hard to get people to come to in-person events, so we're really glad that you all were courageous and took time out of your Thursday evenings to join us for a really interesting conversation about PFAS and its connection to the climate crisis. Um, I'm sure we're all feeling overwhelmed for a myriad reasons when we're thinking about all of the problems that we face in the world today. Uh, but I hope that we feel a little more joyful about meeting tonight and gathering tonight because the more we learn together, the better we are able to fight these challenges that we continue to face every day. So the way this evening will work is we're going to play a video to refresh everyone's memory. Just a quick temperature check, actually. Who has never heard of PFAS before? Perfect, one person. <laughs> it's great. No, this is great. So who, is, who like knows about PFAS but is not ready to be a panelist on PFAS? Okay, so more people. So we will uh, play a quick video to refresh your, all of our memories on like what PFAS is and why it's so concerning and why it's devastating to our um, you know, world. And then we will, I will invite our wonderful panelists to come up and I will start a discussion with them. And then if you have questions, we will invite some audience members up to ask any questions you have uh, regarding PFAS. So I think those are all for my opening remarks. Oh, actually, I'm not done. I want to say thank you to a lot of people right now. First, I want to say thank you to Wendy McCluskey for helping plan this event. It's really phenomenal to work with you. I want to say thank you to Jill Feldman, who is unfortunately not here tonight, um, but she was just as monumental in making this event happen. And hey, Louise, Jill. Yeah. woo, Jill, and Louise Bowditch of Mothers Out Front Brookline, who also was really important in making this event happen, um, and Mothers Out Front. I also want to say thank you to the Social Science and Environmental Health Research Institute at Northeastern for sponsoring this event and making sure that we can have some delicious food to enjoy. And of course, thank you to our wonderful panelists who you will all meet tonight who are really fantastic and have some great wisdom to share. Um, and if I forget to thank anyone, you will hear about it in an email and I will <laughs> thank more people. So without further ado, we're going to hit the space bar and play a video that's just quickly 10 minutes and yeah, refresh our memories on PFAS. It's a silent threat lurking where you'd least expect it, in our drinking water. We assume, of course, it's safe, but scientists are warning about a common and potentially dangerous chemical that can survive in the ground and in our water forever. On a cold winter day on the Stone Ridge Dairy Farm in Arundel, Maine, Fred Stone was more worried about his cows being cold than himself, especially his prized brown Swiss, named Blue. She likes to give me a hard time as much as she can. <laughs> Fred and his wife, Laura, are only the latest generation to work this dairy. It's been in the family for over a century. But since November of 2016, every drop of milk, that white gold that's been a reliable livelihood for generations, is now being poured right down the drain. That's a hell of a waste. Even I can't drink it. He had no idea the wastewater that the state licensed him to use to fertilize his fields was also swimming with potentially toxic chemicals called PFAS. Now, his land, his cows, and yes, their milk are all contaminated. Had you ever heard of PFAS or any Never. of these chemicals? Never. A lot of people haven't. PFAS is an acronym for a family of man-made compounds called per- and polyfluoroalkali substances, the CDC has listed a host of health effects believed to be associated with exposure to those chemicals, including cancer, liver damage, increased cholesterol, and a lot more. The chemicals are so highly mobile, they're not only being found in soil and groundwater, but in the atmosphere, too. In fact, they've even been detected in raindrops falling in some of the most remote areas of the world. This story is about a new plastic material trademark Teflon. PFAS chemicals have been around for decades, 
Oh, good thing it's Teflon. DuPont was the first to use PFAS in Teflon, giving us those nonstick pots and pans. Half of this piece of carpet has been treated with this new finish. The other half has not. 3M used a different PFAS in its once popular fabric protector, Scotchgard. Today, those chemical cousins can still be found in almost anything designed to fend off oil or water or grease. That includes things like pizza boxes, paper plates, rain jackets, ski wax, even guitar strings. PFAS are basically impossible to escape, and scientists say they are likely here to stay. They are nearly indestructible. You just can't get rid of them. You can't get rid of them. Patrick McRoy, the former deputy director of the advocacy group Defend Our Health in Maine, explains just why that staying power is so very troubling. A lot of chemicals, when they go into your body or when they end up in the environment, they break down, they slowly decompose. PFAS don't do that. Once you put PFAS somewhere, it's going to stay there practically forever. That means the levels of these so-called forever chemicals can build up and linger in our bloodstreams forever. How high were your levels when they told you about your water? They're supposed to be under 40 parts per trillion. Yeah. Ours is 26,000. 26,000? 26, per Thousand. trillion, yep. I know, I know. <laughs> Kathy and Bruce Harrington, who live next to a farm, were notified by Maine's Department of Environmental Protection that their drinking water was tainted with PFAS. The likely source was two industrial plants not far away. Your well is right there. Yep, well is right there. They come and tested our water and they said, we'll send you a report in a couple of weeks or whatever. And they called us in a few days and they said, do not drink your water, don't use it for cooking, nothing. All for what, asks Bruce. Bottom line is we don't need freaking eggs to slide out of pans versus people dying. PFAS contamination is really a national crisis, and the real scale of contamination is, is staggering. The more we test, the more we find it. Melanie Benish, legislative attorney at the Environmental Working Group in Washington, says thousands of sites nationwide are polluted with PFAS, and she lays the blame for that growing crisis squarely at the feet of the companies who invented the chemicals in the first place. It is the manufacturers like DuPont, and 3M who have gotten us here today. So they've known for 70 years that they were poisoning the water and they didn't tell the EPA, they didn't tell their neighbors, they didn't tell their workers, they didn't tell anyone because they were making too much money. In the last two decades, thousands of lawsuits have been brought against the manufacturers for allegedly knowing PFAS chemicals were dangerous. While most deny they did anything wrong, settlement offers have been pouring in to the tune of billions of dollars. But Benish says the manufacturers aren't the only ones to blame. There has also been regulatory failure. The FDA, new in the 1960s. The Department of Defense, new in the 1970s. The EPA has known since at least the 90s. And they didn't treat the issue with the amount of urgency that it needed. Regulating PFAS is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. DuPont and 3M phased out two of the PFAS suspected of being the most harmful, but they still manufacture others. In fact, there are thousands of variants. Many of them have real similarities that make it very likely that one is just as toxic as the other. Take this plant DuPont built in North Carolina back in the 70s, and then spun off to a different company called Comores back in 2015. It's almost like a forensic kind of activity. Almost a decade ago, Detlef Kanape, an environmental engineering professor at North Carolina State University, started testing the water near that plant that sits right along the Cape Fear River. In 2017, his research made headlines. The study said a new PFAS called Gen X was clearly present in the water. And if you look at this, there's, there's, you know, the water is completely clear and there's really nothing wrong with it, but it does have very high levels of PFAS in it, you know, several thousand nanograms per liter. It's unholy. We live in America. I should be able to enjoy a shower and not worry that it's going to give me or my kids cancer. I don't know that I shuffled these cards. Emily Donovan, a mother of two, lives about 80 miles downstream from the Kemors plant. 
The Cape Fear River is a source of drinking water for more than 350,000 people in and around Wilmington. She, like most people, just always assumed it was safe. The EPA doesn't require utilities to regularly test for them. So there's really no way for the average American to know if it's even in their drinking water right now, or in their food, or in their air. Based on what it called new evidence, this past June, the EPA did update its drinking water advisories about PFAS, warning that even the tiniest amounts over a lifetime may be enough to cause negative health effects in humans. But it stopped short of creating a new federal drinking water standard. There has been no new drinking water standard in the United States since the 1990s. 30 years. Do a post with some of that. And so tell us which state Emily co-founded Clean Cape Fear. It's a community action group that, among other things, has been fighting for both federal and state agencies to crack down harder on all of the PFAS pollutants. You have two choices. You can, you can have a breakdown about it, or you can channel that energy and that heartbreak into something productive and create a positive. Camours was forced by state environmental regulators to install a host of anti-pollution technologies. It's cost them millions. In a statement to CBS News, the company says it's destroying over 99.99% of PFAS in the air. And it's reduced PFAS compounds reaching the Cape Fear River by 97%. As for PFAS that have built up in the ground over the years, Camour says it will build a barrier wall that will capture and treat the groundwater, a process it says will remove nearly all of them. The exposure has dropped dramatically for people who live downstream. It's much tougher for the people who live immediately around the plant whose wells are contaminated. This is two-week-old two weeks old. seedling. Okay. Mm -hmm. What Professor Canape is now interested in investigating is to see just how much of any PFAS is present in the food grown nearby. We have analyzed some of the produce from backyard gardens in that area that suggests the levels can be quite high. I'm scared that it is too late. I'm scared that we're going to die because of what we've ingested. Residents like Jane Jacobs, a member of the native Tuscarora Nation, have always seen the land as sacred. But she fears the blight on her tribe's land might just end a way of life. My people have always hunted in these swamps, but they're fed by the rivers. So now the animals are polluted the same way the water is polluted because they drink out of the rivers and out of the swamps. What do you think, Reuben? You're not going to make any sound, are you? No one who lives off the land would willingly poison it. There you go. Fred is certainly one of those people. Uh. As are farmers in nearly every state who use treated wastewater to nourish their fields. He, just like his father and his grandfather before him, saw their soil as part of their soul. Cold and drought were supposed to be the biggest threats, not a chemical made by man. At some point in time, I'm going to have to tell my, my father and my grandfather what I did with the farm that they entrusted me with. But this wasn't your fault, though. It wasn't my fault, but it was under my watch. Now it's, it's going to be gone. That's it. That's the end of the road. Thank you. So on that sober note, um, we'll invite our panelists up to join us at the front, please. And we'll start with our questions and introductions. All right, so I will start with introductions from our wonderful panelists, and they'll each share with us in a brief two-minute uh, spiel about their work and what concerns them the most about the PFAS that they um, study. 
So starting with Laura Orlando, Laura has over 30 years of experience working on sustainable systems in the built environment with a special focus on community-led water and sanitation projects. She has researched toxic substances in municipal water and sewer systems and how pollutants get into those water systems in the first place. She is a co-founder and trustee at the Ecological Health Network, uh, senior science advisor at Just Zero, and trustee and contributing editor at Barn Raising Media. Thank you, Laura, for joining us tonight. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you to Mothers Out Front, and thank you to you, Miranda, and Northeastern, um, and for all of you for coming out. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about PFAS, like probably the rest of the people at the panel until the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something like that, but I make it a habit to follow what goes into the sewer and what comes out of it. Um, and it's not only human excreta. Uh, and um, the, the, the clip we just saw, they got one thing wrong. It was not wastewater that was spread on the farms. It was sewage sludge, um, which is no, loaded with uh, PFAS. And, um, and, and that brought this particular family of chemicals to my attention. And uh, I teach at BU School of Public Health as well. And uh, so some of the things that we talk about is what do we do about this? How do we, is there a treatment? Um, what does it mean to separate, to destroy? What are the disposal issues regarding that? Um, what does it mean for human health? What does it mean for ecological health? And so I look forward to sharing uh, that with you all. Thank you, Laura. And next we have Dr. Kim Garrett, uh, who is an environmental toxicologist working with PFAS and the PFAS Project Lab at Northeastern University. And she studies the connections between environmental chemicals and social structures, currently focused on sources of PFAS chemicals and community exposure experiences. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be invited. Can you hear me all right? OK, great. Um, so I am an environmental toxicologist and my background is in inorganic chemical toxicology and, and now I've found myself working in uh, the humanities department at Northeastern University in their social science environmental health research institute and I am really interested in seeing the ways that a single chemical, something that we see as very separate and very, you know, scientific and very um, specific influences our social systems and how our social systems influence we, the way we interact with molecules. And PFAS is a really important molecule that impacts our social systems and our social systems and governance systems have allowed to um, lead to contamination. And the things that concern me the most about PFAS at this moment are some of the regulatory loopholes that are allowing PFAS chemicals to be continuously pumped into the environment. So um, the clip that we watched really uh, positively classified PFAS as a family of chemicals. And if you had asked someone who works for 3M how many PFAS are there, they would maybe say two or three. But if you ask the EPA and other chemists how many PFAS there are, there are over 14,000. And not all of those 14,000 have necessarily been used in our water systems, but we really need to approach this broad class of chemicals as a class and a family. Uh, but Right now, there are loopholes that allow um, companies to decide the definition of a PFAS and individual states to, divide, to define a PFAS. And so that's something that, that I like to look out for. But um, I'm also working on mapping PFAS spatially and seeing what that means for environmental justice and uh, the distance that PFAS can, can move from sources. Yes, thank you, Kim. And not a very happy family of chemicals at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next we have Dr. Laurel Shader. Um, Dr. Laurel Shader is a senior scientist at Silent Spring Institute in Newton with expertise in environmental engineering and chemistry and public health. Her research focuses on understanding exposures to everyday chemicals of concern, including PFAS in drinking water, food, and consumer products, and working to reduce exposures to these harmful chemicals and to educate and empower impacted communities. Thank you, Laurel Shader, for joining us. Sure. Can you hear me okay? 
Um, well, it's really a privilege to be here. Thanks to Mothers Out Front for organizing this event and Miranda as well and, and everyone else who took a part in organizing this. Um, so I've been studying PFAS um, since about 2009. Um, so Silent Spring Institute is a nonprofit research organization and uh, our mission is to understand exposures to everyday chemicals in our products, in our indoor environments, in our food and water, um, and what that means for our health with a particular focus on women's health and breast cancer prevention. We were founded because of concerns about uh, breast cancer rates on Cape Cod by activists at Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. So my first um, exposure to PFAS, well not actual chemical exposure, but uh, <laughs> professional exposure was through a study of um, unregulated drinking water contaminants in public and private drinking water wells on Cape Cod. Um, I wasn't familiar with PFAS at the time, um, but we were actually the first to find PFAS in Cape Cod drinking water. Um, and a lot of my research since then has really um, focused on PFAS, not just in drinking water, but also in food, um, fast food packaging, um, and also in consumer products and trying to understand the relative contributions of those different exposures um, to our health um, and what we can do to reduce people's exposures. Um, I'm also concerned about disparities in exposures. Um, recently, we, I co-authored a paper that found that public water supplies that serve higher communities with higher proportions of Hispanic or Latino residents and black residents are more likely to have PFAS. So I'm worried about those um, disparities that can occur. Um, you may have seen a study earlier this year that looked at freshwater fish um, and exposures, and so that makes me thinking about um, subsistence fishers or tribal communities that are more heavily reliant on those resources. So there's kind of a lot of down news, but someone earlier asked what's good news, and I would say that there's been a, there's a lot of action happening right now. Um, there's a lot of regulations um, and legislation that's being considered or that's been adopted, um, some of which is happening here in Massachusetts. Um, so it's heartening to see a lot of reaction and a lot of regulators and scientists and community groups really tackling this issue. Um, and to Kim's point about the class-based approach and to realize we can't just swap out one for another. Um, not everyone's on board with that. Industries wants to point out all the differences among the PFAS, but um, I think there is gaining a lot of traction, the idea that we really need to tackle this family of chemicals all together and that we can't deal with one of each one separately. Yes, well put, well put. And next we have Robin Bergman. Robin has been a political and environmental activist since her early teens, actively observing the very first Earth Day by organizing a cleanup in her neighborhood. Uh, more recently, she worked as the field director for an environmental candidate in Cambridge City Council and helped organize several large forums on climate issues, both in Arlington and statewide. Most recently, Robin co-founded the Trees as a Public Good statewide network and is a member of our Revolution Massachusetts Climate Crisis Working Group and um, helped research and organize a warrant ar article for a moratorium and study committee on the installation of new artificial turf in Arlington. She is a craftsperson and elected Arlington Town Meeting member and a co-founder of Green Arlington. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for putting this together. I'd like to give a shout out and thank you to ACMI, our local community media, for providing all the sound systems. Um, so I'm more like you. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher, per se. But as an activist, I started to run into issues with artificial turf while I was trying to save trees. And so I su suddenly got aware. I, I had been aware of the DuPont. Uh, problem and I'd been following that but I didn't really put them all together as the same kind of class of chemicals and um, so sometime last year I started hearing more and more about PFAS and I started to really pay attention and go to different forums with different scientists and the more I heard the more I got really upset about it and when I thought about it further, I realized that it resonated with me because when I was growing up, I was, I didn't know it at the time, but I lived near a Superfund site. And downhill from where I was, um, suddenly like my mother's friends were getting breast cancer, some of them dying from it. And then my, my sister's best friend at age eight died of cancer also, um, of more of a blood cancer. And, you know, we thought we were 
okay because we were uphill. But then my mother ended up with cancer five times and I've had a lumpectomy and now everyone I know practically has had either breast cancer or something else. So I started to get really, really upset about it and started to think about what I could do. So I uh, joined forces with several people who are in the room tonight to put up a warrant article in Arlington against artificial turf. Because one of the things that I, I kept hearing about water, but I didn't hear anything about artificial turf, and it's often left out of the list of products. Because PFAS is in so many things, you would not believe how many things. It's in contact lenses. It's in dental floss. It's in paper goods. You know, I mean, it's in everything. So we have a real problem on our hands. Um, anyway, our, our warrant article, I can talk about that more later if people are interested. It was a bittersweet ending because we didn't get the moratorium that we wanted, but I would say it was successful in that we forced a lot of people to have to learn about PFAS and artificial turf. And, you know, kicking and screaming. They really didn't want to. And they don't really want to hear about it, but we made them have to. And so I consider that a success. And we did get um, a study committee, which is going to be happening during the next year, to look into it in Arlington to make some recommendations. So we're hoping that we can keep new artificial turf from happening here. And one other thing I wanted to say is there was recently, last week, um, the legislature held a hearing on PFAS, and I don't think a recording of it is up yet, but you can still submit written testimony against it. And I prepared a handout, which is at the table, which tells you how. Fantastic, thank you. We're so glad you're here um, to share more about this. So the way the panel will work, I'll ask a few questions, and then we do have a microphone for audience members. When I invite audience members, you're more than welcome to stand up, and when the time comes, you can ask questions that you have as well. Um, and I might direct some questions at one panelist in particular, but everyone is welcome to jump in and uh, start us off. So I'll start us off with Kim. I have a chemistry question. Are fossil fuels used to make PFAS? I think so. <laughs> Fossil fuels are used to make so many products. They're certainly involved in the energy production behind making these complex molecules, and they're also heavily involved in their destruction. So one of the key factors of PFAS that makes them so persistent is their carbon fluoride bond. That's one of the strongest bonds we can observe in chemistry, and it takes an immense amount of energy to break that. And it doesn't, it takes more than, you know, just a rainstorm to break that molecule down. It even takes more than our liver enzymes to break that down. And so on that scale, uh, PFAS is highly um, fossil fuel dependent in our current state of destruction. But I'm sure that it is used in their production. I do not have the mechanism on hand, to though, but I'm, I'm certain that they are. Gotcha, thank you. I was, you're answering both questions because I was going to reverse that and ask you, like, are they used in the production of fossil fuels, like fracking or gas? So, oh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, um, there are a few reports that recently came out of the um, organization Physicians for Social Responsibility. In a variety of states, they've been working with uh, an organization from Western Pennsylvania called Frack Tracker, where they've been looking at unknown chemicals in fracking fluid and fracking wastewater. Currently, we have something called the Halliburton loophole, which uh, allows oil and gas development and specifically fracking to be exempt from the Clean Water Act. And so they don't have to um, report a lot of the chemicals that they're, they're pumping in. And so it, it kind of comes down to these um, very thoughtful groups of scientists who are interested and have the energy and ability to go out and find what is used in fracking wastewater, but um, PFAS have been found in almost all of the, the wells that they've found. Yeah, <laughs> let that sink in. <laughs> so the next question I have, I really would like everyone to answer if they have their own take, but I'll uh, st have us start off with Laura. Um, how, you know, speaking to the title of this event, which is PFAS and the climate crisis, how else might the PFAS be related, the PFAS crisis, be related to climate change? Uh, PFAS intersects with climate change in its manufacturing. Um, 
and with ecological health and human health. And when we look at point sources of PFAS, we, 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 can, we look at manufacturing. There's 17 plants as of 2022. Half of them are owned by DuPont and 3M around the country. One of them in Louisville, Kentucky is a Camorra's plant that produces approximately half of the fluoro chemicals that are the building blocks of PFAS. Um, those manufacturing facilities dump uh, about 7 million metric tons equivalent of carbon dioxide. It's the equivalent of two coal burning plants running full blast all year long. Um, and the, uh, uh, the uh, indirect uh, sources of PFAS are in the waste management world, right? So what goes down the drain? What we saw in the clip. So the, that, uh, that it, you, it ends up in really two places. One, landfills, and it ends up in the landfill leachate. So when it rains, for instance, uh, that water percolates through a landfill, and not all, but many landfills are lined with plastic. When that, le land, when that leachate's captured, it's loaded with PFAS at levels, you know, in the many tens of thousands of parts per trillion, in the parts per billion, and so on. And that landfill leachate um, goes to wastewater treatment plants. Wastewater treatment plants are another source not only from the landfill leachate, but from what goes down the drain, right? The many different things that go down the drain. And uh, wastewater treatment plants do not treat for PFAS. In fact, the conditions in the wastewater treatment plant can multiply the amount of PFAS. It's a chemistry set. So the wastewater treatment plant has the building blocks to make terminal PFAS, I don't, I don't know a better word for it, the stuff that we care so much about, the PFOA and PFOS. So you can get, when you measure what goes in, you can get up to 20 times more coming out, right? So when it comes out, it goes to two places, the treated wastewater, which a receiving body of water takes. In St. Louis, it goes into the Mississippi River. Boston goes into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, in the North Andover plant, the second largest in Massachusetts, goes into the Merrimack River. And then another byproduct of wastewater treatment is sewage sludge, sewage sludge which um, another name for that is biosolids. And that's what was spread on those farms in um, Maine. Horror after horror, right? But there's nothing that says we have to keep spreading sewage sludge on farms, right? We could have a national ban. Maine has banned that practice. So what Kim was saying, these regulatory failures are fixable. And the, the troubles with PFAS are on, you know, they're, they're, they seem to, every time you look, everything you touch, it's, it's all around. And that is part of the playbook of industry to say, well, geez, you know, it's in your blood already. It's in everything. So it's, you know, my father at the table 30 years ago, everything gives you cancer, right? Um, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. And, not, and, and so, um, you know, I, I hope I have an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we can do. But those are some examples of, of the intersection with, uh, with climate. And also, let me say, methane, um, which is being belched from these landfills and wastewater treatment plants, they make up about 20% of all the methane in the United States that goes up into the atmosphere. And methane's a very powerful greenhouse gas. So closing landfills will help solve the methane problem and um, the PFAS problem, the, for example. Can I say something? Two things. One is um, with climate change and the climate crisis, we're going to have a scarcity of drinkable water, and this is just making it worse. Um, the other thing is, the climate's getting hotter. Actually, New England is one of the places on the globe that's getting hotter than anywhere else faster, which is really insane, but it is. Um, so from the artificial turf lens, um, it's very hot, too hot. It will, it will be too hot to play on those fields because it holds heat. 
because of the substance. It's basically a big plastic mat, some of it with rubber, some of it with other uh, materials, but it's just going to get impossible. I know that the town of Burlington closes down their artificial turf fields as soon as it hits 85 degrees and, hu and high humidity, just to give you an example. So the more days that we have that are high temperatures, the worse it's going to get. Thank you. So I'm going to ask this question for Laurel first. Um, 3M recently announced they're one of the PFAS manufacturers. They recently announced that they will cease PFAS production by 2025, which surprised me because I feel like no one ever sets a goal from two years from now. Usually it's like 15 years from now. Um, but they're, you know, claiming that they'll cease PFAS production by in two years from now. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shader, what do you make of this announcement and its implications for the future of these forever chemicals? Um, I think it remains to be seen. Um, it's certainly encouraging. I would say pretty late, but encouraging. Um, it's, I guess it remains to be seen. Will other manufacturers follow suit or will they kind of move into that space? Um, for some of the PFAS that are no longer manufactured in the, in the U.S., and we don't have to do a whole deep chemistry dive, but there are some PFAS that are no longer manufactured in the U.S. Um, even industry will recognize that they have a very long amount of time that they stay in our bodies, so years that they circulate in our blood, even if you could stop your exposure to them, um, and the, the highest level of concerns about toxicity. So, but they, industry's response has been to say, okay, we won't make those anymore, but we make these other ones, and these are safe. Trust us on these being safe. But they look very similar chemically. Um, uh, we know that some of those long chain PFAS are still being manufactured overseas in China. So um, it's, it's like good news, but it's hard to know how, how excited to be about it. Yeah. Um, can I add something? Yeah. So love that they are recognizing that there is an issue with PFAS chemicals, but I am very curious about what their definition of PFAS are. Like Dr. Shader mentioned, they stopped making two uh, long chain PFAS chemicals, which we think of long chain as having six carbons and anything below that having fewer than six carbons all in a row. Uh, but the evidence shows that those short chains behave in very similar ways to the long chains. And so I would be very curious to see what their definition of for this ban is because they could say we're going to stop manufacturing PFAS of a certain length, but that doesn't incorporate the full scale. Yeah, so you got to always read the fine print. <laughs> An important reminder. Um, so this question I'll start off with Kim. Uh, earlier this month we had some hazy skies from wildfires in Canada or I guess today Washington DC and Chicago had some of the worst air quality in the world um, which I was surprised about like the world but it's true. And we know that PFAS are used in flame retardants and firefighting foam as climate change worsens, and with it the wildfires, will PFAS use increase to fight these worsening fires? It's possible that they will, but a positive that we've seen in US regulation right now is that they're starting to address the use of fluorinated firefighting foams. And if you had asked that question 10 years ago, I would have said, what's a PFAS? And also, yes. <laughs> um, but there's been a lot of activism by firefighter groups and ally scientists who have done health studies and just physical testing of their gear to see how concentrated these things are with PFAS and how um, it sheds from the gear. And also uh, fluorinated firefighting foams are one of the, the highest concentrated sources of PFAS in our environments being sprayed at airports, firefighting training facilities, military bases for years, uh, and just remaining in the environment and moving through our drinking water. Um, but I would say I'm not sure at the moment. I hope that it turns out that we ban fluorinated firefighting foams because there all, are useful alternatives. And the arguments against some of these alternatives are the matter of one second of efficacy. So. Uh, the US military requires firefighting foams to be able to put out fires in a certain amount of time. I think it's around 30 seconds. If the alternatives put a fire out in 31 seconds, not allowed to use them. So that's an interesting um, definitional question again. 
If I could just add on to, to what Kim said, um, certainly that is like the small differences in efficacy <laughs> and some of the standards specified that to meet the standard, it had to have PFAS in it. So by definition, a fluorine-free foam couldn't meet that definition. Um, I think also one like teeny bit of good news, sometimes you see the pictures of fires and you see them putting foam on it and you might worry, is that the foam that has PFAS? And typically that's not the same type of foam. So there's class A foams and class B foams. So as Kim said, at military bases and airports where there's flammable fuels, typically that's where you use the class B foams. And those are the AFFF, aqueous film forming foams that are the ones that typically have had PFAS, but increasingly there are fluorine free options. The class A foams are used on wildfires or like house fires. Um, and typically haven't had um, PFAS. So that's like a, a little bit of good news, but certainly if there's more fires and there's more firefighter gear needed and more like time spent fighting fires, that does raise concerns about uh, on the job exposures among firefighters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, this is helpful. Um, so this is, I wanna hear from everyone on this question. And uh, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while because I guess the PFAS crisis kind of reminds me of the crisis of CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons that the Montreal Protocol banned. And these are the things you find in refrigerators, you know, back in the 20th century. Um, and some of them are still making their way to the ozone to this day, um, even though we've largely like stopped the hole from getting larger, if I'm summarizing that somewhat correctly. Um, but yeah, some researchers have predicted that we will be grappling with PFAS contamination for hundreds of years. And um, you know, I recall that a ban was necessary for chlorofluorocarbons to avert further crisis in the ozone layer. And of course, there's still CFCs making their way to the atmosphere. So if it seems like there's, we're still having this problem with CFCs, um, will we be facing a similar issue with PFAS um, where we're grappling with contamination long after they're completely banned, and if they ever are completely banned. And um, what are the best and worst case scenarios then for dealing with PFAS? And we can start with Laura. Sure. First, I'd like to put um, Kim and Laurel in charge of oh. our PFAS regulation <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> um, they're called forever chemicals for a reason, right? They don't break down in the soil, in the water, in our bodies, uh, but what we can do is concentrate them, right? So back to landfill leachate. Uh, the largest landfill in New York, Seneca Meadows, sends about 65 or 70 million gallons of landfill leachate to multiple wastewater treatment plants in New York State. Um, they send the largest amount to Buffalo, 40 million gallons uh, last year. Um, as I mentioned, the Wastewater treatment plant doesn't do anything to the PFAS. In fact, it, the precursors in there probably very likely multiply the PFAS that are coming out the outfall pipe, which goes into the Niagara River. It doesn't have to be that way. The wastewater treatment, I mean the landfill leachate could concentrate the PFAS by, for instance, partially separating it. There is no technology that completely destroys PFAS at the moment. Um, there's no technology that completely separates PFAS. When you see 97% or 95%, it matters what you start with when something makes you sick at levels or where the EPA is saying, you know, um, there is no safe level, level, right? So we have to keep that in mind. But we can concentrate it um, in the membrane mediums, uh, et cetera, that we use to... For instance, you can use membranes like reverse osmosis um, to, uh, that have membranes or granulated activated carbon, which some water treatment facilities use. And that, that provides a, a, a partial separation and the PFAS concentrate in those mediums. Same with um, sewage sludge. You have a disposal issue. I'm not saying it's all fixed, but it's the same with what's coming out the wastewater treatment plant. PFOS, for, for example, tends to partition into the solids, which that's what the sewage sludge uh, essentially uh, is. And so the solid material doesn't have to be spread in a thin layer on millions of acres of farmland, right? And so by concentrating 
and selectively being very smart with regard to environmental justice and public health and the science chemistry, you know, we can at least make sure these materials aren't in our children's lunch boxes, on the fields where our kids play sports, um, or in our, on our fields in the food products we eat. Can I just make one point that's been missing from the conversation, which is one of the problems with PFAS is that the accumulation of exposures makes it more and more toxic to people. So the more you're exposed, the worse it is. And it builds up in your system. And that's one of the problems. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. There are so many complex parts of PFAS exposure. Um, what I would say about the best case scenario is that right now, we forgot that our bathtub was running, that our bathtub was filling up. Our bathroom is starting to be filled with water. It's on the floor. We don't come out with a mop and start mopping first. We turn off the tap to stop it from filling any further. Right now, the best case scenario is that our oceans and our soil and our drinking water are contaminated with PFAS. But we have an opportunity to turn off the tap while we address uh, destruction issues, concentration issues. And it's a global problem. I'm sure a lot of us became a lot more familiar with the size of the ocean in the past week or two, <laughs> learning just how deep it actually is and how much water is in there. Um, but that PFAS can be in all of that. It's and really dilute levels are, are really problematic. And so turning off the tap is the best case scenario right now so that we can then address the global issue as it stands at this moment with hopefully, you know, all of those great technologies that are coming out and you see the headlines about them. I hope that they work at a, a large scale. We don't have the evidence for their scalability right now. And often they only address a few of the 14,000 chemicals, but you know, um, I'm, really hopeful that those will help us out, but the main thing right now is turning off the tap. And the worst case scenario would be just continuing to produce PFAS. And if I could build on that and get back to the Montreal um, protocol as well, um, there's a, a framework towards this issue of turning off the tap. And if you think about it, it's, it's not like one tap. It's like lots of taps coming from lots of different places. Um, so there's a lot of places where we learned in the film that there are a lot of ways that we can be exposed, a lot of different types of products that they're in. Um, and I guess one of the ways that the Montreal Protocol addressed the ozone depleting chemicals was to figure out like where are the non-essential uses and sort of tackling those first. Um, one of the things that industry will say is that, you know, PFAS are in life-saving medical devices and protective equipment. And, um, and maybe those are ones where we want to yeah, for now, maybe they're, they are serving a role of protecting people's health, and we don't have a good alternative yet. But dental floss, food packaging, there are a lot of non-essential uses, and those are like the easy, maybe they're the, the faucets are easier to turn off um, when we think about turning off the tap. And so there's a framework that's, um, I think it's catching some momentum um, called the Essential Uses Framework, and it sort of puts PFAS uses into three categories. So one are non-essential uses, so these are uses where there's no real benefit for health or safety, or there's a very easy alternative, so like food packaging or cosmetics, things like that. Um, a second band might be um, like firefighting foam, um, like Kim mentioned, where it is serving an important function. We absolutely want firefighters to have the tools they need to fight fires, but there are alternatives. And so let's rely on those alternatives that don't have such persistent chemicals. And then there's a category that you know is considered essential uses, not essential chemicals, but essential uses. Um, and it's important to think of that as not a static category. You know, maybe we don't have an alternative right now, but with new research and development, there can be alternatives in the future. Um, so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to start with because it can be overwhelming when there's so many different things. Um, so, can I say one more quick thing, which is. Um, this fight is going on internationally, and there's something called the Madrid Statement, and it's been signed by uh, scientists, I think 250 scientists in 38 countries, to commit themselves to fighting this. So I find that hopeful also. Yeah, and it reminds me too of like the scientists around the world who 
come together to affirm that indeed the climate crisis is real. <laughs> um, so it seems like that's starting to pick up steam with PFAS too around the world and scientists gathering to say this is something we need to pay attention to. And I really like the metaphor of like turning off the faucet because it can be kind of overwhelming to think of how do we start to address the is this issue that is so large, simply like climate change too. And turning off the faucet seems like, you know, and there's, like you said, there's a low hanging fruit to easier faucets to turn off than others. So, so I want to also invite our audience to start asking questions if they have any. Um, we have a fantastic microphone up there that will move to the middle. And if anyone has a question, they can uh, enter the aisle and line up. Um, yes, it looks like Diane has a question to start. Fantastic. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first, uh, two questions, and I'm not going to wait between them, okay? The first is, um, has there been um, a link, verifiable link, between PFAS and cancer? And the reason why I ask that first question is that these kind of overwhelming problems, um, such as asbestos, opioids, tobacco, have all benefited from class actions. But you need those kinds of proofs. So do you know if that link has been made? And do you know if there are any class action suits going on. Thank you. Um, I'll take a first pass and others can feel free to, to chime in. Um, so yes, yeah, certain types of cancers have been linked to PFAS exposure. Um, has anyone seen Dark Waters or The Devil We Know? Um, so that was based in a community in West Virginia close to a DuPont plant where people got exposed to high levels of P one long chain PFAS called PFOA, also known as C8. Um, and a lawsuit against DuPont funded a, a big epidemiological, so uh, a big health study. Um, and from that, um, the scientists who were part of that panel concluded that uh, exposure to PFOA was linked to testicular and kidney cancer. Um, and several other types of cancers have been linked to um, PFAS exposures. Um, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine did um, say there was also a link with breast cancer, although my understanding is that the, the link is maybe a little less certain. Um, so, so that's an answer to the first part of your question. In terms of class action lawsuits, um, and I feel like I need to read the news every day because there's always some new PFAS news, but just like yesterday, I still need to read the articles about it. There was a, um, there've been class action lawsuits. There's different kinds. Um, some have to do with individual's health, um, but there's also a big class action lawsuit um, where the plaintiffs are water suppliers that have had to expend millions of dollars to put in place water treatment. Um, a lot of my work focuses on Cape Cod, and the, just as an example, to give you a sense of the cost, um, the Hyannis water system that has 14,000 customers has spent $20 million to put in place carbon filtration. Um, and that's being, that cost is being borne by um, the ratepayers and the residents of Cape Cod. Um, and so, in some ways that's an easier lawsuit because they're not trying to say this harmed anyone's health. They're just trying to say like, we had to spend this much money and that's not fair for us to have to pay for that. Um, so those, those, and so there was just a settlement. I think it was that case or maybe it was another case. Maybe someone else has been following the ins and outs of that um, multi-district litigation that was being held in South Carolina. Um, and it was 3M, I believe, that started to settle. And I still need to find out which water supplies that applies to because um, sometimes the news articles are a little opaque. Um, in terms of class action lawsuits by individuals who think their health has been harmed, um, I think there are some. I know on, on Cape Cod I've seen ads for lawyers who are looking for people who might have had exposures. I don't know of a, a really big one, but um, like I said, it's hard to keep up with all the PFAS news, so I wonder if anyone else wants to add to that. You might know more, Kim. Uh, um, I don't know of any specific class action lawsuits, and especially around cancer, but I would say that um, our uh, goalpost, I guess, for a class action lawsuit of being cancer, there are so many other health issues that are associated with 
um, PFAS exposure that, um, you know, we shouldn't have to wait until it is a known human carcinogen to regulate and to prevent its um, release into the environment. But I would keep an eye on firefighting communities. I think that that is a, is a workplace exposure that disproportionately affects fire, fighter, firefighters. And I think that they have, you know, certainly grounds for uh, unsafe workplace complaints and, and things like that, so. I know that, I don't know if they have determined that there's definitely a link, but there have been um, like clusters of can different kinds of cancer in different places, especially I'm looking at it from the lens of artificial turf, soccer players goalies who are close to the ground, loads of them are getting a certain kind of cancer. And then also the Philadelphia Phillies, um, a lot of their players got brain cancer from playing on artificial turf. So they're looking at these things and collecting data. I don't think anything's you know, definitive yet, but it's looking that way. Well, and also I think the military is um, taking a look at their use of fire Yeah, Dr. Shader brought up an interesting point that I wanted to touch back on, and that's the taxpayers and how we're paying for our own pollution. And I think that's a really compelling link to climate change, too, because a lot of the fossil fuel infrastructure that we're building or that utility companies are making a profit off of building today, taxpayers are going to have to continue paying the burdens of that decades from now, where energy will just cost a lot more. So this theme or this phenomenon of companies that make a lot of profit off of the backs of taxpayers and taxpayers' health is just a really co compelling connection to the PFAS crisis and the climate crisis because it's, you know, the same or similar companies who are making these same practices and getting away with the same stuff on the backs of uh, taxpayers and people like us. So I have another question uh, for anyone really to jump in and answer, and that is, are some PFAS exposures more consequential than others? I know we touched briefly on like food packaging and drinking water, um, but you know, if you were, I mean, not that this is the most necessary question because we simply don't want PFAS in anything, whether it's food packaging or turf fields. Um, but in terms of like taking a shower or drinking water or, you know, playing on an astroturf field and having takeout every night, you know, are there <laughs> PFAS? <laughs> using nonstick cookware. Uh, yeah, or using nonstick cookware, like, you know. Um, I can jump in just from the baseline toxicology perspective. For any chemical exposure, we think of it as a function of the concentration the duration and the amount of times that you uh, experience that exposure. And so from that base level, occupational exposures are of a main concern for me because they're typically um, highly concentrated. Uh, if we're thinking of firefighting um, uniforms or the a a triple F, the fluorinated firefighting foams, or even people who work in factories who produce PFAS chemicals, they're getting the off-gassing as well. And so we know that inhalation is very different than um, uh, absor is different than ingestion and different than dermal exposure. And for a lot of chemicals, inhalation is a way more ex uh, severe exposure. So I'm uh, always concerned about occupational exposures. I guess for me as an exposure scientist, I think about how we get exposed in different ways. And, and I think about like a pie chart, right? If you look at all the PFAS that's coming into your body, like where is most of that coming from? And the answer, of course, is it depends. So if you live in a community where the water is contaminated, it's likely that drinking water would be your largest source of exposure. Um, typically, as that problem is recognized, water systems have been stepping up and taking those contaminated wells offline or putting in place treatment. EPA is like inching closer to a standard, so it won't just be states like Massachusetts that have their own standards, but all water supplies will have to start testing for and addressing PFAS. Um, and then there's a, a piece of pie that comes from food and food packaging, so it depends like what are you eating? Do you eat a lot of microwave popcorn? Do you eat a lot of fast food? Um, there's been some links between um, consumption of fish and shellfish and higher PFAS levels in blood in the general population. Um, and then it also depends on consumer products as well. Um, and there are different ways that the PFAS can get into your body. So some PFAS can, are actually volatile, so they can 
come out of the carpet. This carpet might have PFAS in it and end up in the air, and so we breathe those in. Um, we also, we don't think about it, but we all ingest a little bit of dust every day, and dust is kind of this um, reservoir for um, toxic chemicals in our homes. And if you happen to be a kid, say, and you put your hands in your mouth a lot, or you're just really close to the ground a lot, you might, um, per unit of your body weight, you get more exposure that way. Um, and then there's occupational exposures as well. So certainly, you know, firefighters in certain industries. Think about people who, um, for instance, ski, uh, people who put ski wax on skis, they can have quite high exposures. Or people who use a lot of floor wax or apply um, uh, Scotch Guard or other um, stain resistant coatings to furniture. So everyone's like little pie looks different. Um, and researchers, I think, are trying to wrap their heads around, honestly, for a typical um, person, what does that pie look like? Um, and for me, something I struggle with because we at Science Spring think a lot about like what, how we can translate our research into um, useful information. And in long term, big picture, we are trying to change chemical policies and inform retailers. We don't think it should be on each individual to have to think about this stuff. But there are things we can do as individuals to protect our families and ourselves. And so we do try to translate our research in that way. And sometimes I feel like there's a little bit of a mismatch because it's easy to think about consumer products. You mentioned nonstick pans. I actually don't know how much exposure you really get from a pan unless you overheat it um, compared to, say, Scotchgard in, 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 um, in your couch um, compared to fish. And, and I think people are reluctant to say, you know, you shouldn't eat fish or shellfish, and there's a lot of health benefits to that. Um, so I think we're, it's helpful to do more research to understand, like, what those, that pie of exposure is and make sure that the messages that we're giving out are consistent with that. Um, but I think with consumer products, it's kind of the easiest low-hanging fruit for, for those of us who can figure out, you know, avoiding stain-resistant products or microwave popcorn or the things that we can avoid. Some of these other ones are harder to tackle. And I think I'd like to bring the social justice lens to That's this as well. That's what I was going to bring up. Right. So more, more vulnerable populations, communities that are already suffering from um, uh, health disparities. They have more exposures. They have less access to uh, medical care. Um, uh, are, you know, it's kind of like the double whammy, right? They're more impacted by the climate catastrophe, they're more impacted by the PFAS exposures that they're getting, and they're more exposed, which Laurel mentioned a paper that, um, it's a terrific paper, it's published I think in February, right, um, that she's a co-author on, and I'll let her speak to the paper, God, in front of the author, I'm not gonna summarize it. <laughs> but, uh, um, but it, you know, it showed that people of color, black and brown communities, have greater exposure to um, uh, water that has PFAS in it um, than and then white right? communities. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, back to landfills. Um, Claire Cannon is a researcher at the University of California Davis, and she's done some terrific work that looks at um, municipal landfills and where they're located. She looked at every county in the United States, and surprise, surprise, they're located near in um, uh, uh, near communities of color. Um, single head of women who are single head of households living in poverty are much more likely to be living near a landfill. Uh, no landfill liner um, uh, is intact. So there's groundwater pollution, there's airborne pollution, including from PFAS in these places. So those exposures just get multiplied. And, and, and so the social justice lens is a really important place to, to look as well. Um, one thing I wanted to add, too, is for artificial turf, for example, there really is no such thing as recycling for it. And it's either going into landfills or industry is now saying that they can burn it, but they're using <laughs> chemical burning and it's going into the air and then it's landing on everything surrounding it, which are usually EJ communities. And then one other thing, which is I've been told by some scientists not to eat freshwater fish, that they're worse than seafood. I don't know about the fish, the uh, salinity of the water for the fish. Uh, 
as an impact, but as uh, an environmental justice angle. Also, um, some of the work that we're doing in the PFAS Project Lab is looking at um, how regulations on fish and how um, how contamination of fish can impact indigenous communities and low-income communities and folks who uh, subsistence fish and subsistence forage and hunt. Um, and so it is a really big issue. There's a lot of work going on in the Great Lakes states over um, you know, environmental justice and access to fish. So that's another um, area to keep your eye on. A study just came out, uh, I just read about it today. I read the abstract, but the business of bioaccumulation, predator fish, um, they're seeing, I, I, which I, I'm not surprised, but they're seeing that uh, the big things that eat the little things are accumulating more PFAS in their fatty tissue bodies. And one other dimension to the social justice issue has to do with, um, and we know this for buying organic produce or buying eco-friendly products. It's, it's easy for us to put a recommendation out, like eat more fresh, Fruit, or you know, eat you know, eat or buy products that don't say stain resistant, or you know, buy the green certified products. They always cost more, um, and so if your income is lower, like you can't buy those products, and so there are disparities in there. And some of the we try to be cognizant of some of the messages that we we share. You know, it, not everyone is able to implement them in the same way. Um, I've been thinking about this because my son is 15 and he wants to have a little hangout spot with his friends, and we're trying to buy a beanbag chair. And all the ones that he's finding, I'm sure, have flame retardants and PFAS. And like, I study this stuff every day, and I can't figure out if it has PFAS in it. And I, I'm Googling the green ones, and they cost like five times as much. And that's just not fair. So we need to change that. Yes, go ahead. Do you want uh, this microphone? Uh, I have a couple of questions that are just really very personal, I guess. Well, one was related to what you were just saying. I've been um, vegan, macrobiotic, um, you know, um, organic for 50 years, and so I thought I was going to miss the bullet. <laughs> and then I remember, uh, like 20 years ago, I started hearing about how California was using this marvelous new sewage on their organic fields, and I thought, oh yeah, well, there, there it goes, you know. So if you're going to Whole Foods and, and you see that the stuff's produced in Mexico or California and it's organic, I, I, I'm going to ask you, but my assumption is we don't, we don't miss the bullet that way. But the other thing that I look, was Googling right before I came over here, I've just had eye surgery and they put an acrylic lens in my eye and everything on acrylic and PFAS says, Oh, acrylic is so much better than plastic. It's so much better than glass. And, and that there's, no, there's nothing that I could find in my brief Googling that relates it to PFAS. So I wonder if um, you could just a personal <laughs> answer to those, those two yeah. things. I can I, speak to the organic standard. If it says, if in the United States, so those rules were promulgated 1999, I think, um, uh, if it says orga USDA organic, USDA organic, regardless of where it was sourced, Mexico or elsewhere, if it says USDA organic, it was not produced with sewage sludge, right? Because that is against the organic rules. Um, now, can I'm not saying that people aren't sneaking around, and I don't know. It's it's some of it is producer responsibility, but by and large, those rules are protecting us from pesticides, sludge, and irradiation. Those are the three, three big things that the standards um, uh, keep out or keep our food from being processed or uh, using those particular um, methods or products. So I can speak to that. Um, the acrylic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know that PFAS are used in the manufacturing of plastics because they keep the machinery nice and slippery. So if you think of something as an extruder, you don't want things to get stuck in there, and so PFAS keep that slippery. Of course, there are alternatives, and but the PFAS ends up on some of the products. But I do not know much about acrylic or eye acrylic. <laughs> I just know I have read that contact lenses have them. It I've speaks read contact lens solutions. Oh, really? Can, oh. And sometimes anti 
fogging yeah. solutions that people yeah. were using when everyone was wearing masks and so people still wear masks and it, glasses right. fog up so um, I it, don't yeah I don't know as I don't know specifically about acrylic and other types of plastics as well sometimes get yeah. Well, it speaks to the looking <laughs> yeah. at PFAS as a class of chemicals, right? And it speaks to turning off the tap. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying, oh, does this have it and this have it and how much of that and what kind over there and what's the appropriate, what's the safe concentration. It speaks to that. This is all of it, ban it all. Uh, our confusion over this also speaks to confidential business information and the power of industry to use uh, determine what, are, what it needs to um, report or what it, it shouldn't report and how public that information can be. So it comes down to consumers to make those decisions, but we don't have adequate information to make those decisions. So it's kind of a, a bind. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't confusing enough, <laughs> another thing that can happen is sometimes plastics are treated with fluorine gas to make them um, last longer. Um, and the chemistry that can happen with the fluorine gas and the plastic can make PFAS. Um, and there was, I think it was um, pesticide jugs that had, they figured out that the pesticides had PFAS and they weren't sure why. And PFAS can be added to pesticides also, but they figured out it came from the plastics and it was this like fluorination of the plastic. So they weren't adding PFAS to the plastic, but it, it formed. So in case you weren't worried enough already, like that's another thing that's making my brain <laughs> um, I'm interested in how we influence municipalities for use reduction, for buying uh, and investing in artificial turf fields, but also all kinds of plastics, utensils in school cafeterias, and um, my personal pet peeve, plastic park benches. I much prefer wood. Um, so. I'm just curious, you know, what can we do and how do we influence our municipality decision makers um, that we need a plastic use reduction and that would seem to impact the PFAS use uh, reduction or exposure, hopefully, reduction. So, thank you. Well, it's something that at just zero that we're uh, taking on both from an advocacy and a legislative, um, you know, sort of both uh, paths. And uh, so part of that is model bills. Uh, part of that is uh, showing municipalities and communities, those that are doing it right, um, uh, sharing that information with other communities, looking at what works and what doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, Beyond Plastics is doing terrific work in terms of uh, lobbying and other legislative work. Um, so supporting those organizations, but also supporting each other uh, as we um, try to ban single-use plastic and um, better understand ways that we can s drastically reduce the um, plastic that's use in use in our society today. One thing we... Uh, that I'm working on, which I don't know if it'll directly immediately have an effect, but I'm working with a small group statewide. Um, any 10 citizens in Massachusetts can put a petition into the government asking them to regulate something, and we are writing one to ask them to regulate artificial turf. So that's in process. And, and we're going to be soliciting um, signatures from everyone too, so that it's not just 10 people, it's going to be hundreds of people that sign it to make them, to kind of force them to take action. My question is about dental prosthetics because the porcelain that used to be put in the mouth with PFM is now a thing of the past and it's now replaced by zirconia. And everybody has crowns in their mouths. I was wondering if you have any information about that. Thank you. I do not. <laughs> I do not. not I have something to Google now. <laughs> <laughs> I speak to your, your point earlier about how it's not necessarily about identifying like which products have PFAS in them, because we know that PFAS are so widely used that we can, you know, assume that they're, you know, in, 
most products that we use unnecessarily. So I think it really speaks to how it's how it, impossible to keep track of every pos every little thing that they're adding PFAS to. I'm, I'm just going to make one other recommendation, which is to pick up one of these handouts that I created and write into our state legislators asking them to ban PFAS. Yes, fantastic. So we are running out of time, but we do have a small action that we want to invite everyone to take part in tonight to support Massachusetts legislators passing this bill on PFAS regulation. Um, if my laptop could be opened <laughs> again, and um, we're going to put up a QR code on the screen, and people can either scan the QR code, and that will actually send a really great letter uh, to your legislators, uh, your state legislators in Massachusetts, urging them or saying that as your as the constituent, you really support this PFAS bill. Yes, I want to thank you all for being here. It was wonderful. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to everyone who turned out tonight. Um, it's great to see everyone in person. And um, I appreciate you all for coming out and learning about PFAS. I hope you take further action. If you want to take some more food before you leave, we tried to make it a PFAS, a, you know, a plastic-free food event, which was surprisingly difficult, <laughs> really challenging. So. Um, Please uh, help yourself. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much.